Hi, I'm Filippo Olivieri. Welcome back to Cracking the Cube, a series of lectures presenting my work on Stanley Kubrick. This episode is about the genesis of the story of AI artificial intelligence, perhaps my favorite of all Kubrick's unmade films. And it's also about the project's failure and how Kubrick became less and less capable of actually making a film in his later years. It's quite a controversial argument. Let's see if you agree with me. Stanley Kubrick made only 13 films, but left behind many unrealized projects. In fact, I have identified about 60 of them. In this lecture, I'm going to focus on AI Artificial Intelligence, a project that in many ways stands out as unique. First of all, it had the longest gestation. From 1976, when Kubrick first approached the sci-fi writer Brian Aldiss, to 1996, when he put the film on hold and focused on Eyes Wide Shut instead. It involved the highest number of writers, five, and it was made in the end by another director, Steven Spielberg, who also was among those that Kubrick consulted to get feedback on the story. This unique quality comes from the fact that the project did not begin by adapting an existing literary material, which was Kubrick's custom, but by expanding on it. Kubrick intended to replicate what he had done with 2001 A Space Odyssey, when he selected Arthur C. Clarke's short story The Sentinel and developed it with additional material, both new and inspired by other stories by Clarke. This time the springboard was Aldis's Super Toys Last All Summer Long, a vignette set in an overpopulated future where Monica, a childless woman, adopts a surrogate robot child. This presentation will give a comprehensive account of Kubrick's endeavor outlining the story development and will offer a reason for Kubrick's failure at this particular project, which can also shed some light on why the director became increasingly less productive in his later years. As I said, the AI project had its starting point in 1976 when Kubrick, looking for a new story after Barry Lyndon, contacted Brian Aldiss. It is not clear when exactly Super Toys was first mentioned during their occasional meetings and phone calls, but we know that Kubrick bought the rights to the story in 1982. From a note that all this jotted down at the end of a phone call, we can see that Kubrick had rather clear ideas on how to move forward. The film had to be emotionally moving and must have an episodic structure, modeled on the adventures of Pinocchio, the Carlo Collodi children's book about an animated puppet who goes through many hazards before getting his reward, becoming a real boy and reuniting with his father slash maker. The fairy tale framework is emphasized by another model. The new story should start with David and his teddy bear being left in a wood by Monica, mirroring the beginning of Hansel and Gretel. Kubrick asked all this to help him populate such scenario with his imagination. All this produced a few outlines following Kubrick's ideas and after a couple of incomplete drafts, in January 1983 wrote a full treatment with a new plot. David is kidnapped by Russian intelligence and involved in an espionage comprison break type of story set on an artificial satellite. It reads like a stereotypical 1980s action flick, I mean, it would have been perfect for Arnold Schwarzenegger. But the problem is that this storyline forgot the core idea, a robot boy longing for his mother's love. The only interesting bit in the treatment comes at the end. In a coda set 40 years later, David is rescued around the planet Mars, brought back to Earth and put inside a museum in a replica of the family's apartment, with a surrogate robotic mother who cuddles him for all eternity. Even though Monica is absent, this coda contains a raw idea that would remain till the end of the creative process. Kubrick suggested to use some of Aldis's other stories to help them devise a more solid plot. This is, after all, what proved successful with Clark for 2001. Over the course of 1983, Aldis produced two different incomplete versions, both reworkings of the beginning of the story, now set in a post-nuclear apocalypse world. This is a second element that got Kubrick's attention and would be preserved. 
The collaboration with all this was suspended at this point, apparently for a dispute over payments. Kubrick put the project on hold and revived it after he had finished with Full Metal Jacket. Quite uncharacteristically of him, he spoke about it with a fellow director, Steven Spielberg, and told him that he needed someone good at writing children characters. Spielberg suggested his sister Ran, who had just co-written the script for the Penny Marshall film Big, but she decided to pass on the project. In 1989, Kubrick wrote to Brian Aldiss again, but he was busy, so Kubrick approached another sci-fi writer, Bob Shaw. Shaw found working with Kubrick extremely difficult and only lasted for six weeks. Though I have not studied his papers at the Kubrick archive yet, from his interviews it seems that Shaw did not contribute to the story in any significant way. In February 1919, Aldiss was ready to get back to Super Toys. He produced a new treatment set on the outskirts of a drowned New York City. This version introduced a biological son for Monica, who is ill and hibernated while a cure is being developed. David is a prototype and is tested with Monica, who struggles to love him. When her real son comes back home, the two children fight all the time and David is brought back to the factory. There, a G.I. Joe robot is introduced as a companion for David. Their first adventure is getting to Tin Town, where discarded robots live together. A number of different story fragments now follow, and for which more research is needed. At this stage, I can say that perhaps this indicates that all these encountered problems in inventing plot points that would please Kubrick. This is supported by Kubrick's query to a science fiction bookseller in London, who in Britain are writers with lots of ideas. This is how Ian Watson was brought on board in April and hired to write an original take on the material. Apparently Kubrick started from scratch. He gave Watson the original Super Toys story and two books, again Pinocchio and Mind Children, an essay about the evolution of the human race in relation to artificial intelligence. He told Watson to do anything he wanted with the material, provided that New York was flooded. Watson delivered his story Foxtrot the next month. In less than 30 pages, Foxtrot covered past and future times, virtual reality, time travel and space exploration with a survey of all humanity's attempts at artificial beings, from ancient China and Egypt to the Jewish folklore legend of the Golem, grounded on a philosophical disquisition on how humans and robots could coexist and possibly evolve together. Watson lived up to the promise of generating lots of ideas. Over the course of 1990, his fertile imagination, stimulated by Kubrick's unfailing requests for new material, produced a cascade of inventions, narrative detours, variations and possibilities that elevated all this vignette into a series of monumental and compelling possible stories. Watson reworked many myths, legends and archetypes of Western culture from the Arthurian cycle, 12 robots on a mission to find the Graal of robots becoming real, to Romeo and Juliet, Monica and Joe as star-crossed lovers, from Christian mythology, David as Micaiah, a Mecha Messiah who begins a new religion, to environmental concerns, a nuclear disaster inspired by Chernobyl, time travel, alchemy, human sacrifices, body modification, performance art, pandemic diseases, sexual intercourse by mechanical proxy, trash reality shows on television, etc., etc. It really is a mind-blowing amount of fantastic material. While I was reading it all, I was reminded of a quote by Kubrick from 1970. If the plot, by some miraculous accident of fate and talent on the part of the writer, happens to illuminate the theme and offer valid and interesting ways of exploring sub-themes within the plot, then you have the magical ingredients with which you can do something really interesting. This is exactly what Watson gave Kubrick. But I was surprised to discover that Kubrick invariably discarded everything, especially what, to me, were the most striking and promising ideas. What only survived in Watson's final treatment are a sexualized version of G.I. Joe, now Gigolo Joe, the character of Lalitha, a surrogate mother figure for David, 
and the jump of 2000 years into the future with the extinction of the human race and the one day only resurrection of Monica. At the end of a year's work, Watson's treatment seems to me a curtailed product of his creativity. The reason for this may be that, according to several sources, Kubrick was aiming at the children market, so he needed a simple storyline. In any case, this does not diminish a certain feeling of frustration that I had while reading all the wonderful pages that Watson produced and Kubrick rejected. That Christmas, Watson too was taken aback. When he read it, um, uh, he, he, he just said, I'm despondent. I'm Meaning he didn't like it, you know, it didn't have Im enough impact for him. Uh, he'd been working on it for too long. Uh, it, it was probably he needed to get away from it. Uh, probably he'd been reading the same things over and over and over again until they just seemed, well, completely banal, obvious and boring and, uh, uh, and dull. Once again, Kubrick felt he needed a fresh take on the material. In January 1991, he called Arthur Clarke and asked his opinion on Watson's final treatment. Clarke sent a series of notes back which criticized the scientific plausibility of some events and offered alternatives to fix what he felt were weak plot points. Kubrick did not reply. Instead, he phoned Ian Watson again and asked him to produce a short synopsis that he could show to people. It is a condensed version of the treatment with slight changes, except for a new coda in which David's determination to have his mother back pushes the robots of the future to rethink the resuscitation procedure and find a way to bring back hundreds of humans and repopulate the Earth. In a rare moment of enthusiasm, Kubrick told Watson this was one of the great stories of the world. And yet, that December, he formally hired Clark and said he could do pretty much what he wanted with Watson's material, provided he stuck to the same plot ideas. In April 1992, Clark sent a five-page synopsis titled Child of the Sun, which retained only minimal elements from Super Toys, scrapping almost everything that Watson had done. Kubrick commented, I fear you have not only thrown out the baby with the bathwater, but the bathtub, the bathroom, indeed the house itself. Kubrick then spent two years tinkering with the story by himself, stitching up scenes from the various versions. He produced two screenplays, the first is the one titled AI Artificial Intelligence, which resulted in Warner Brothers announcing the project. It was during this time that Kubrick began dealing with the technical problems inherent in a sci-fi picture. He consulted with Industrial Light and Magic and with James Cameron for his new company Digital Domain. At the end of 1994, Kubrick also hired a conceptual designer, Chris Baker, to help him visualize the fictional world of AI. This might indicate that the story was now in a convincing enough shape to make Kubrick start the production, but no, that was not the case. In May 1994, he summoned yet another writer, Sarah Maitland, the first on the project not to come out of a science fiction background, but a myth and fairy story literary tradition. Her task was to restore coherence. By the time I came to the project, Maitland wrote in her memoir, it had become enormous, unwieldy, unfocused. Go figure. She also had to give more substance to the emotional content of the narrative, especially reworking the character of Monica. In February 95, Maitland delivered a full treatment, but her work continued through the rest of the year. In retrospect, she has a knowledge that she could not give Kubrick what he wanted. In fact, parallel to his work with Maitland, Kubrick also corresponded again with Steven Spielberg, to whom he sent a revised treatment in 1996, which Spielberg annotated and sent back. It seems Kubrick gave Spielberg his own treatment from three years earlier, ignoring what Maitland had done. Without further research, I can't explain why, but the exchange does indicate that Kubrick was indeed not entirely satisfied with Maitland's work either. Now, Spielberg was supposed to direct the film with Kubrick in a producing-only capacity, but things didn't run smoothly. It was great. It was going to be a great relationship. And then I kept getting faxes from Stanley all night long. The, 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 the amount of information he was giving me, including shots and where the camera should go, mm -hmm. was so extraordinarily precise and detailed that I finally 
called him on the phone and said, Stanley, I can't direct this movie. You are, you know, these faxes are crying out to me to say to you, you have to direct it. This is your movie. And I, and I withdrew from the project. I am not going to discuss what happened after Kubrick died when Spielberg went solo and wrote, produced and directed AI, because this presentation is about the Kubrick project, something that ceased to exist with Kubrick's passing. I'm not only saying that Spielberg's film is different from what Kubrick might have realized had he directed it, because of course their sensibilities and styles are radically different. What I hope I have demonstrated is that AI was still an unfinished business for Kubrick. We simply do not know where he wanted this project to go, what he might have changed once more in the script. Stanley Kubrick's AI remains, in my opinion, an unrealized film. I will spend some time now examining the reasons why the project failed. I mean, of course AI came to nothing because Kubrick died before getting back to it, but I'm not entirely sure he would have made it anyway. Let me explain what I mean. With such a complex and ambitious project, there can't be a single cause of failure, and in fact several have been proposed by different people, but basically they all agree it had to do with its very complexity and ambitiousness. As far as the technique was concerned, there were virtually insurmountable problems regarding the special effects, both to realize androids that could act and to visualize the futuristic drowned world. And in terms of story, character and themes, the film had a wide, or perhaps too wide, a scope that it quickly became difficult to manage. But a similar complexity and boldness were precisely what characterized 2001 A Space Odyssey. We do not regard that film as a series of insurmountable problems simply because Kubrick solved them all, but not many people at that time would have bet on his success. And in fact, when the film opened, everybody was astonished by what Kubrick managed to put on screen, images that no one thought were possible and a story so rich and deep that has been stirring our imagination ever since. The reason why AI wasn't made then must be something else, and I propose it was Kubrick himself, or rather, the Kubrick of his later years compared to the Kubrick that brought 2001 to success in the 60s. Kubrick sometimes spoke about a growing difficulty in finding a new project worthy of his protracted efforts, blaming his higher and higher standards, and a will to never repeat himself. But the problem with AI is not about that. Kubrick clearly loved the Super Toys story and found it different enough to wanting to work on it. Some scholars, especially Katrina McAvoy and Peter Kramer, have pointed out that Kubrick's modus operandi was characterized by an extensive exploration in every area, from script development to poster design. I want to expand on this concept by looking at the writer's experience. Ian Watson best expressed what it meant to write for Kubrick. Stanley knew that he wanted something. He did not know what it was. It was my job uh, to discover what it was that he wanted, and then he would recognize it. Sarah Maitland concurred. The real job sometimes seemed to be guessing what he was seeing, then converting it into words so he could turn it back into images. In his exploration of the subject matter, Kubrick rarely provided instructions or offered suggestions to his writers, often limiting himself to react to their ideas. It was truly an open-ended exploration. For example, Kubrick never directed Watson. He let him write scenes according to a broad discussion, gave him the occasional nudge and vetted his pages. Actually, I should say that he directed him just the way he directed his actors. There is a famous anecdote about Malcolm McDowell asking Kubrick for suggestions. Gee, Malcolm, Kubrick replied, I'm not Rada, I hired you to do the acting. Virtually every cast and crew member has told similar stories. Kubrick's M.O. with anyone was, show me what you can do and I'll pick what I like. This touches on what I believe is at the core of Kubrick's artistry. More than a creative genius, Kubrick was a reactive genius. He needed to be exposed to lots of stimuli and inputs before he could decide what he felt was right for his film. 
Of course, this method took a lot of time, but what I find really surprising with AI is that the end result of Watson's work, the ideas that Kubrick approved, appears to contain all the elements that were already established during Brian Aldiss's time. The flooded New York, the resurrection of Monica via a sample of her DNA, the Pinocchio theme park, the Blue Fairy. I suspect Kubrick only needed someone to fuse all the bits that he had into a compelling plot, but didn't say so, to see whether something good or better might suddenly arise. And something good did arise thanks to Watson's imagination, as we have seen, but I can't shake off a feeling of tremendous waste. Watson wrote 234,000 words, I mean, Tolstoy, War and Peace is shorter. I cannot help but wonder whether the job would have been quicker had Kubrick been more clear and direct. The job might have even been better had Watson worked with a well-defined goal in mind. The fact that Arthur Clarke failed with AI when he had succeeded with 2001 shows the inherent problems with this reactive approach. The writer was baffled by Kubrick's request. I still don't understand why you think I'm the person to help on super toys, he told him. This sort of emotional family drama is exactly the kind of thing I'm bad at. And yet, Kubrick didn't explain and willingly gave him a year to think about the project in the hope that something interesting might happen. In earlier years, Kubrick had been quite capable of deciding what was good and explored alternatives as a way to better the final product. Now it seems to me that he was less and less certain in identifying what he wanted and often lost himself in too many permutations. The fact that he was not dealing with an adaptation but needed to invent a plot might have exacerbated his tendency. Another complicating factor comes into play if we consider the context in which Kubrick worked in the second half of his career, under an exclusive contract with Warner Brothers. I'm referring here to James Fenwick's thesis that Kubrick, by extending the areas he wished to control, gained too much power and enjoyed a complete free reign, with no interference from studio executives. Ian Watson perceived the peculiar relationship between director and studio. Warner Brothers were you know, very relaxed about it. Uh, they said to me, you know, Ian, we'd just like to have another uh, movie out of Stanley uh, before he pops his clogs, you know. No pressure, no deadline, no demand whatsoever. Kubrick's endless exploration of all the avenues had become literally endless. Again, a comparison with 2001 is illuminating. For that film, Kubrick spent almost a year inventing a story with Clark and then fixed its weakness when he met with the designers, supervised the set construction, did the casting and so on. The two threads went on simultaneously and obviously the more pressing practical needs of the actual shooting soon started to dictate the pace of the production, with Kubrick forced to make a few story decisions impromptu. Now, with AI, he never really moved to the production phase. He kept working and working on the story, sending for yet more writers again and again. The fact that Warner's was paying for all the preparatory work did not push Kubrick into action. The AI project always remained speculative. Again, in the wise words of Ian Watson... Uh, well, I never believed that the movie would be made. Uh, oh, really? Oh, I... No, I know. Why? Uh, well, because it seemed so completely capricious. I felt that I had been hired by an extremely rich eccentric uh, with um, superpowers uh, to play in his nursery uh, with his collection of toys. In theory, perhaps, one could obtain a perfect story in such fashion, but, as Sarah Maitland warned, this presupposed an infinity of time and resources. Because Warner Bros. seemed to be willing to give him both, Kubrick found himself in the best and worst position for someone of his temper. A renowned perfectionist, at the end of his career, Kubrick had all the time in the world to make something perfect. In an imperfect world, it proved fatal. What do you think? Would you say that Kubrick was actually ready to put AI into production after he had finished with Eyes Wide Shut? Let me know in the comments. 
This is the last episode in my Cracking the Cube series, at least until I participate in another academic conference and prepare a new presentation. I thank you all very much for your attention, your comments and your appreciation. Keep watching Kubrick's films and read about them and discuss them with your friends. If you have any question, you know how to find me. Grazie a tutti, ciao!